Welcome to the Moving Past You radio show, a show about identifying, confronting, and embracing the obstacles that block and delay us in walking in our divine purpose. Each week, we delve into the complexities and rewards of walking in your purpose. Now, here's your host, Juanita Gaynor. Good evening, everyone. Happy Friday. Not only is it Friday and we have a great weekend coming, it is the last Friday in September. Can you believe it? We have gone a whole entire month in season four and we've had some amazing guests. And tonight is not going to change that. We're going to have an amazing guest as well. Um, This amazing woman is, I can say, is like a sister friend. Um, When you go through trauma and when you go through things in life, you don't understand or realize that you have people who have gone through it and they may have gone through it differently than what you did, but they understand, they are loving it and, and they're walking truly in the things that what you do. And that's what makes this so, 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 so amazing. Um, I can't thank everyone enough for just being there, for supporting, for doing all of the amazing and wonderful things that you guys are doing to support the overall show. And I am, like I said, I am so grateful. Um, but today we're going to talk about some sensitive topics like we always do. Um, it wouldn't be me. It wouldn't be me if we wasn't hitting those topics that everyone doesn't want to hear. Um, so tonight we are going to have Miss Clarissa Bags. Now, I may have butchered her first name, so I'll have her correct that when she comes on because, you know, I can admit a mistake if I have. Um, and we're going to talk um, the judgment of a tree. Now, what we're going to do is before I read her bio and bring her on, I am going to um, play a trigger warning because, again, tonight's topic will be a little sensitive and we want to be considerate about our viewers and our listeners about the things that they're going to be going through. Hello, everyone. Before we dive into today's important discussion about sexual assault, we want to take a moment to acknowledge that this topic can be deeply triggering and emotional for many individuals. We are committed to creating a safe and supportive space for our audience. If you have experienced sexual assault or are sensitive to this topic, please be aware that the following conversation may contain explicit content and detailed discussions. It is perfectly okay to step away from this discussion if you feel overwhelmed at any point. Your well-being is our top priority, and we encourage you to prioritize your mental and emotional health. If you need support during or after this discussion, consider reaching out to a trusted friend, family member, or a mental health professional who can provide guidance and assistance. Additionally, if you or someone you know is in immediate danger or needs help related to sexual assault, please don't hesitate to contact your local emergency services or a crisis hotline, such as the National Sexual Assault Hotline at 1-800-656-HOPE. That's 1-800-656-4673. We appreciate your courage in joining us for this conversation, and we hope that together we can raise awareness, provide support, and promote healing for those who have been affected by sexual assault. Thank you for joining us today. Let's begin our discussion with the utmost compassion and understanding for one another. And with that, let me introduce tonight's guest. Born and raised in New Orleans, no love. Clarissa Bags overcame a harrowing childhood marked by adversity and cruelty, growing up as the eldest of 12 siblings. I'm just a little me, I only got two. I'm a little girl. (laughs) She faced an emotional and physical and sexual abuse when her mother introduced a new partner during her second grade years. The abuse took multiple forms, including emotional and psychological torment as their family's religion was abruptly changed, isolating them. In the third grade, Clarissa was separated from her siblings and during daily rapes from her mother's second husband. At just 12 years old, she became a mother 
facing societal judgment and shame as people failed to question the abuser who had victimized her at the age of 11. Despite her trauma, Clarissa's resilience led her to establish the nonprofit All I Know Incorporated, bridging the gap between resources for at-risk individuals. She also founded Red Petunia Productions and the award-winning talk show Still Surviving, transforming it into a movement focused on mental health and wellness. Today, Clarissa Maggs is an award-winning filmmaker, producer, director, inspirational speaker, author, and humanitarian, using her voice to heal and empower survivors and advocate for change. She fearlessly addresses the pressing issues of child abuse, sexual assault, and mental health wellness, striving to transform laws, conversations, and attitudes towards these critical matters. Currently working on the documentary Consequence, she aims to shed light. I said it again. She aims to shed light on child suicide and its far-reaching effects on global society. Clarissa Bag's story is one of unwavering strength, hope, and compassion. Through her journey from victim to advocate, she amplifies the resilience of the human spirit, inspiring positive change and healing in the lives of countless individuals. I am going to bring on up Miss Clarissa. How are you today? I am fabulous. How are you? I am doing so well. <laughs> good. I'm good. I'm happy to be here. Yes, I'm happy to have you. Um, like I was saying earlier, it's rare that um, I get to speak with someone who really do understands that abuse at a child level. You know, a lot, you know, it, it's hard to... Um, and we have kind of the same thought process on what it is. Like we we call it for what it is. It was it's an assault. It's not just an a, a abuse or whatever. It was rape. It was it wasn't so childish. And we agree on that same thought process. So I am grateful for you. You know, joining to share your story um, of healing and how you've moved on um, that into advocacy. And just to show others that, you know, we have to not only change the narrative, we have to really be there and do what we need to do to focus. And so with that being said, what I want you to do is um, I'm going to give you the stage for a little bit. Um, tell us a little bit more about you um, and what led you at what was the juncture that you said, you know what, I it's time for me to shift from I'm gone from victim to healed advocate, and now I need to make sure others are good. Well, well first of all, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the description of the abuse, because nothing bothers me more than to hear that a child was molested. Because in my mind, molested means, oh, they, they felt on them, or they did this, or did that. Rape, let's call rape, rape. Rape is, is exactly what it is, rape. If there's any kind of penetration, that's right. And I, I like that we call it that. Uh, as you mentioned, I am the eldest of what eventually became 12 kids. There's not a twin in a bunch. And I grew up in a household where it's kind of typical of a lot of African-American households where grandma was raising us. So my grandma was raising us. She would take us to church we didn't have a whole lot, but we really didn't know it. But we were very happy. Now, my mother decided that she needed a, a new guy in her life. And she met the person that would be her second husband. And I, re I distinctly remember my introduction to him because I was with my grandmother in the kitchen. And my mom called. She was in Butte, Montana. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget it. And she puts, she gets on the phone with me and she says, hey, I got this guy that wants to talk to you. You know, I told him all about you and yada, yada, yada. And he gets on the phone and he says, hey, he says, uh, he says, so they call you Toonie. I say, yeah. And immediately he said, yeah, 
What do you mean, yeah? It's yes, sir. You don't ever say yeah to me. I better not ever hear you say that before, again. And yada. And I was stunned because I never had anyone speak to me in that way. But that was my introduction into the life of the person who would test my faith and my belief in everything good and holy. When he finally moved in, I was in the second grade. And by the third grade, he had removed myself and uh, my baby sister, which my mom ended up having a, a daughter for him, removed us from the public school system that we were in and placed us in the Catholic school. Our religion was changed from Kojic to Catholicism instantly. And that was the first step for removing me from my siblings. And the abuse started pretty much right after that. We would play this game where my siblings were, we would all get in the bed and we would play this game called Tickle. So we'd all be in the bed and we'd be laughing and tickling each other. And it was, the, it was kind of weird because he was mean as Satan. But he wanted to play this game, Tickle. But no, none of us caught on to what was really happening. And eventually, my siblings could not play Tickle. Only I could play Tickle. So uh, that went on for probably a few months. And then one day he asked, do you want to know how grown-ups play Tickle? And I said, well, I'm thinking to myself, well, how, how different can tickle be? Tickle is tickle. Grown ups are tickled the same way. And I said, well, I, I guess. And that's when the the rapes began. And it lasted for years, years and years. And I remember his his daughter came to live with us. And I asked him, how come you don't ask her to play tickle with you? You. He says, oh, no, she just she just don't want to do it. And I just don't want to. And he gave me some kind of answer. And he started uh, bothering or raping one of my other sisters. Uh, and he told me one day, he says, well, if you know, if you don't do it, I'll just get. And I'm not going to call my sister's name. because She didn't even know that I know this happened. Um, I'll just, you know, get so and so to do it. And he called her into the kitchen and he had me in the living room. He called her in the kitchen and he put her on the kitchen table and he tried to assault her and she fought back and she ran out of the room. And I remember being just a tad bit envious because I thought, man, how come I'm not that brave? How, how come I couldn't do that? And it, it just, it went on and on for, again for years. And this is from the second grade. Now I'm in the sixth grade and I'm sitting in the dining room at the dining room table and I feel what feels like butterflies. And I thought to myself, I looked down and I thought to myself, hmm, I think I'm pregnant. I mean, I'm 11. And as soon as the thought came, the thought went. It was just a fact. So it wasn't something like, oh, my God, I'm pregnant. What am I going to do? It's, it, it was just a fact of life. And so I never said anything to anyone. And eventually my belly started to grow. And I think he noticed it first because he called me in a room and he asked me if he had a Bible in his hand. And he says, well, you know what happens if you swear on the Bible and you do the opposite? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, what happens? I said, you go to hell, which is what we are taught. You're going to go to hell. And so he had me place my hand on the Bible and swear that if anybody asks if someone touched me, that I would blame his, one of his brothers. 
Now, wow. mind you, this this brother never, ever, ever, ever looked at us sideways. He never was inappropriate. He was always a good uncle to us. But it's his brother. And, and I'm going to skip through a lot of it just for time's sake. But eventually, uh, I had fallen down some stairs one day. And that's not long after that was when my belly started showing. And then finally, my mom decided she was going to take me to the doctor. And we went to this clinic. And the clinic was in a house. And back in those days, way back when, I don't know how old everybody else is, but way back then, there was no such thing as uh, PHI. There was no such thing as we can't discuss medical information in front of everyone. So she takes me. Right into this house that's turned into a doctor's office and they take me in the back and I'm laying on the, on the bed and the doctor comes in and he's talking to me and he's pressing down on my belly and he takes his stethoscope and he listens to my belly and he has this weird look on his face. And then he calls another doctor over a female. She comes over, she does the exact same thing. And then they said, well, I want, we want you to pee in this cup. So I peed in the cup and I went back into the, the waiting room. Now the waiting room is was originally uh, the living room. And the nurse comes out. And this is where I say there's no PHI. The nurse comes out and the nurse says, well, you know, she, we, we did a, a pregnancy test on her and she's pregnant. And my mom went ballistic. Oh, my God. She's She's a really good actress. Oh, my God. Who touched my baby? Who did this to you? And da, 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 da. I mean, she cut up. And so, because I'm not going, I don't want to go to hell. I said, Uncle so-and-so. Oh, I, yeah, I figured that it had to be him because he's much big. What did he do? What did he threaten you with? What did he say? And, and I said, well, I mean, the only thing, the worst thing I could think of that this man would have done was punch me. So I said, well, he, he said he would punch me. Couldn't think of anything worse. Oh, yeah, because right. he's so much bigger than her. And da, da, da. So we get all the way. We're leaving. And not one time did she check on her child. Not one time did she say how are you? I'm sorry this happened to you. All she thought about was, what's she going to tell my grandma? What are my aunts going to think about it? And she's just going, oh, what about so this auntie so-and-so and auntie this and auntie that? Never thought about me. So we get to the house and she decides, you know, she's ranting and raving and she's, all of this stuff is going on. And she gets a gun and she puts me in the car. She got a, um, I can't remember if it was a shotgun or a rifle. I want to say it was a shotgun. But she got the, because we had a lot of long guns, but she got the gun and she put me in a car and she drove me all the way to uh, a little town called St. Martinsville. And that's where he lived. And he let her leave the house because he's, she's saying she's going to kill her, his brother. And wow. He let her leave with the gun and me in the car. We get to the house. She's hunting for him. She's hunting. A whole bunch of stuff happens while while we're there. And the whole time, I'm 11 years old. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. I, I can't let her kill him. I can't let her kill him. And if I let, but if I, if I, if I tell the truth, I'm going to go to hell. So here I am, uh, this kid. I have to decide, do I save this man's life? Or do I go to hell for the rest of my life? You know, for eternity. Wow. Yeah. So. Oh my God. So finally I told her that, you know, who who did it? You know, who got me pregnant? We drove all the way back and now she was gonna kill his brother. He had to have a vasectomy. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> that was his punishment. He had to have a vasectomy, but he stayed in the house. And wow. the rapes continued. And uh 26, I want to say 26 days. Into my 12th birthday, so I was barely 12, uh, I gave birth to my daughter. And and I, I never got to see her until she was some months old. But at the end of the day, and I'm, I'm going to cut it short so you can ask me some questions. But, you know, I, I chose to 
speak to people about this and speak loudly about it because as I started working with youth in the community, I learned that there were people in similar situations, in, in abusive situations. And what was the deciding factor for me was I was talking to a coworker and I told her, I said, you know, I'm talking to people about these different triggers and, you know, people don't understand when they speak up or they speak out and pass judgments on people or they say certain things that it triggers whatever trauma that they've gone through because people would always, when they would hear that I have a child barely 12 years older than me, younger than me, they would say, oh my gosh, you were fast, you were hot in the ass. When I was a kid, I, I never was thinking about little boys. My mama would have did this, my mama would have did that. And not one time did anyone ask, who in the world got an 11 year old child pregnant? They never asked that question. So when I'm talking to this coworker and she says, yeah, she says, for me, the trigger is mayonnaise. And I thought, oh, my God, it's not just me. Because for me, it's ketchup, cold ketchup specifically. But when she says mayonnaise, I knew that I had hit the nail on the head, that this was something that was bigger than me and something that needed to be addressed. And that's a big chunk of why I do what I do. And I can't imagine not doing this. I cannot. And I'm grateful that you can't imagine yourself not doing it. Cause I, I know for me, um, when things were happening, I just, for me, I just went complete opposite. Like I could go without sex. It didn't matter if I had it or whatever. There was never an emotional connection with it. Mm -hmm. It was always considered a means to an end. So if I wasn't intimate, if I didn't have it, it didn't matter. So, you know, people's like, how can you go without it? Eh. Because yeah. that emotional tie was severed. And so um, I want to thank you for just the story, because sometimes we don't even we don't even get that. Sometimes we don't understand the dynamics. It's always, you know just one person when as you think about it, it's an entire community that's complicit yes and the abuse yes and the rape and the torture of our children yes because there were no when when these people you know like now if a kid pops up pregnant they're calling the police they're calling somebody oh, yeah. nobody called anybody to say why this baby pregnant I haven't even had my period yet. I look like a little boy. And here I am. Yeah. Pregnant. Yeah. But nobody, nobody did. And, and you're right. People are complicit in it. And people pile on the shame to the victim and don't hold the abusers or the rapists accountable. You're right about that. Yeah, they don't. And when, when I think about that, the question I want to ask, and it's because, and I know personally, I have this, this, this mother wound, how has that um, affected, how did it affect your relationships specifically with women is I'm asking a specific question specifically with women um, through your healing journey. Initially, the women were doing the exact same thing as men were doing. Oh my gosh, you out here fast, huh? You in these streets, huh? I'm 11 years old. What streets am I in? So women were doing the same thing. And I think, honestly, that for many, it is a form of self defense. Because when I start talking to women or listening to them tell their stories, sadly, so many of the stories are exactly or almost exactly the same and I think that what happens is because the shame has been, then they deflect Yeah, and then you must have been fast they say it's fast so that must mean you were fast too and you know one of the things and even when it comes to men cause I've spoken with men and a lot of people don't talk about you know childhood rape of boys 
don't talk about it. And these men growing grow up with the with the same shame, if not more shame, because you're a man. How you let some other man rape you? No, I was a baby. I was a child. I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. So it it helps that when I share my story, other people feel comfortable sharing their stories. Because when I was going through all of that as a kid, I was also suicidal. I had suicidal ideations. I, all I could think about was how I was going to get out of this. And part of the reason I think for me wanting to do that is, be, and not all of it, but part of it is because people don't tell their stories. And I did not know anybody who went through what I had gone through. Because what, what happens is a lot of times when we go through something and we come out on the other side, we keep it to ourselves. So we do a disservice to the people who need to hear our stories. We do a disservice to not only ourselves, but to the fact that there is hope and that there is life on the other side. And if we open our mouths and we tell our stories, that is a healing bomb, not only for the listener, but it's also a healing bomb for the person who is speaking their truth. And it also highlights the fact that this is so prevalent in our world and that we, we take it as, oh, it's a rite of passage yeah. for boys and girls to go yeah. through this. So it's not as, um, as impactful. And I think one of the, one of the, the sad things is that when we think about rape, most people, when they hear the, the term rape, they think about black eyes, bloody noses, clothes ripped, hair torn out, and all of those things. And that's not always what rape looks like. And I, I think, and, and people might disagree with this, so I have to tread lightly when I say this, but I think that child rape, particularly when it is a constant, that that is more traumatic and more detrimental because a stranger rape, and I'm not taking anything away from it. I promise you I'm not. So people don't inbox me, call me and all of that and say, I'm just dismissing, you know, stranger rapes. And I'm not, I'm not, I promise you I'm not. What I'm saying is that when children are raped by people that live in their homes, people that they depend on, people that they have to feed them, I get raped and then I have to go fix you a plate of food or I have to now let you spit your dentures into my mouth so I can brush your teeth and give you your teeth back. I have to lotion your legs. I have to do all of these things and you just raped me. And you may rape me again the same day or the next day. I got to break bread with you. That's a whole different kind of trauma. And that, that's, it's just every day, every day, every day, or every other day is constant. So, whew, girl, don't go, get me going. <laughs> so, and I'm going to heavily co-sign that. And like I said, like she was saying, we're not um, putting any, you know, this light or anything or making diminishing, you know, stranger rapes. But when it is someone, you know, that you have to have constant, you know, contact with, and then you think about the other people that are in the house or in the family that sweep it under the rug. So you don't get any reprieve. You don't, you know, if you think about, you know, there's no one to protect you. So not only are you being physically abused by, the, you know, traumatized by this person, but you're being emotionally and psychologically and spiritually traumatized by the, you know, the other family members, because they are just, it's like they've turned this blind eye yes. to it. And so by the time, I can say by the time I realized that this wasn't normal, and this is, and, and this has been like years, I say, after it had, you know, the last one ended, I was in my 20s. When I mm. realized that this was not supposed to be a normal part of life that this wasn't supposed to be something every day. And I think that's what we have to let people know about child rape, especially in the home, because they never know that that's not something that's not supposed to happen 
it's ingrained in their day to day life. Yes. Yes, you know, and it, it became so, it became and, a, a a bargaining chip at at some point. You know, it was like because we lived in a two bedroom apartment at eight kids at this time, and we can go outside. There were times we didn't see the light of day for weeks at a time, so we want to go outside and play. So it was like, or my one of my siblings was getting ready to get beat severely because we got those severely. It's one spanking is one thing. It's just a whole other level. And it became a negotiating tool. So if, if this doesn't happen, I'll play tickle with you. So I I'll 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 let you play tickle if 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 they don't do this or or this doesn't happen. And so it's it's sad, but yeah, it's it's a reality for not only myself, but for kids around the around the globe. No. Yeah. What are we gonna do yeah. about it, Juanita? So, t- so tell me. More about, well, tell me about your nonprofit. All I know. <laughs> All I know was formed to uh, have people go out and have conversations with folk about even traumatic events or events uh, that were happening in their lives that. You know, a lot of times people will come and they want to tell you about raising kids. Y'all know everybody got opinions about how you should raise your kids. Mm -hmm. And the ones that come and tell you that don't have any kids, I'm going to need you to sit down. Because you think you, because you got some nieces and nephews and you babysat them for a little while. Now you think you know how to raise some kids. Well, these will be people that are, that have gone through certain situations that are, are able to speak um, in first person about the different things that are that have that have gone on in their life and and the tools that they used and how they were able to do certain things. So that's what that's where it came from. All I know. So all I know is what I know is what I can talk about and the things that I've gone through. I don't, it doesn't matter what I read in a book. This is what worked for me. Awesome. This is what worked for me. Um, and I think that's wonderful because sometimes, so many times, I think people are downgraded for the things that the, they know they work for them because they don't have these scholarly degrees or they didn't study for years. And just because that they didn't do that, they knew enough and how they operated, how their mind works, how their body and their soul work to can do those things that got them to the next level to be able to tell their story to whether of whatever the trauma is. So. I am grateful for that because many people don't even realize that they sometimes, not all the time, a lot of the times they have the power within themselves to begin the healing process, but then knowing enough to collaborate with like a nonprofit like yours to say, be like, okay, maybe I need some professional help too. Mm -hmm. How, how do you work that work with, you know, those that may come to you? Um, How do you shift into the aspect of, Bring it in professionals because I feel personally it, it's helped me, you know, on ways where I thought I had it. And then on the real medical side, mentally, I was nowhere near good. Yeah. I, I you know, I'm I'm really good at making connections. So I talk a lot. So I talk to a lot of people. And oftentimes. The people, remember I told you how I would talk to people and then eventually they start sharing their their stories of trauma. These would be people that are really great professionals out there who did not share their stories. Remember I told you that, you know, Mm. part of the reason that I was even contemplating suicide because I didn't know that there were people out here. And so what I specifically chose were people who did not look like what they went through. Because there's a lot of people out here, and you know this, who go through a particular trauma and they carry it around like a badge of honor. And they use it as a woe is me and oh, have pity on me. Instead of using it and using it as a source of empowerment and finding their purpose. So speaking to people, learning what they've gone through. And I've been blessed in the fact that people are so willing to open up. And tell me stuff that they've never told anyone in their lives. 
And some now sometimes, girl, I'll be like, why is this person telling me this? I, why, <laughs> hold on. why are you calling me? I don't know. I don't know anything about this. But yeah. I thank God for that because I did ask him for the power to be like Jesus in that I am able to heal people from afar. I don't have to touch them. I don't have to be with them. I don't even have to see them in person just to be able to impact lives and, and just put spread that healness and that, that power that exudes from whatever God has given me and whatever makes them think that they could just pick up the phone and call me or send me an email or send me a, a message. And I appreciate that. And I try to make sure that whatever I'm feeding back to them is coming from God because I don't know. But it flows out. It it flows out. It really does. And half the time, I don't remember what I told you. It just comes. It just I promise. I, I don't know what I told you. I remember somebody called me on the phone and they were going through something. Now, part of my brain, this half where the phone was, was thinking, why is she calling me? Why is she calling me? I don't know what she's talking about. What's going on? But the other half of me was just talking. And I was just talking. And she called me not long after and said, hey, everything's great. And I appreciate you and your advice. And I'm thinking, I want to ask her, girl, what did I say? What did I say? But I couldn't. <laughs> Look, and I a thousand, a million percent agree with you because I call those God moments. And, and yes, God has allowed me to see when it shifts because a lot of the times I've, I've been talking or recording and I think I was talking to my, I call her my niece. I've adopted her. My girl, I'm good friend's daughter. And what I did not know is that she was recording and I was talking to her. And before I knew it, it shifted and it was boom. And then just like I, she shifted me and he shifted me out. And yep. so about a week later, she was like, auntie, what you told me was so great. And I'm like, what did I, what? Isn't and so she played it back for me. And I was like, I said, that, that's, I said, I said, that wasn't me. And she was like, what? I said, that was God speaking through me to you. Because yeah. in my infinite self, I ain't got it. I, I tell you that right now, <laughs> you know, so what I want to ask you about before we go into things is how has, when we think about COVID, COVID has been a big shift about um, a lot of things happening in life. Um, how has that either, you know, shown the light on child abuse physically, child rape, a lot of things, domestic violence? Um, how have you seen COVID shed the light on that? Because now these people were in close proximity. They didn't have no reprieve. Has more reportings happened or did you see a lot more, you know, information put out there about abuse? What has happened, I noticed, is that there are a lot of people, a lot more people now, not so much as talking about what ha what may have happened even during COVID. I think it gave them time to be with themselves and to reflect on their lives. Because if you notice, if you watch the news. There's reports of people who are now reporting rapes and abuse that happened years ago. And we're seeing a lot of that that's, that's coming to fruition. Like, wait a minute. So that happened to you too? And these are people who are in prominent roles. These are people who are in, uh, in politics, in entertainment, and they are telling it. So I think that COVID really, really helped to allow people to sit with themselves. Because a lot of times, I know for me, keeping busy, keeping busy keeps me from talking, you know, or, or thinking about it. You know, uh, so now I'm by myself. So all, all it's just me. It's just me and God. That's it. And I can't go anywhere. So now I can reflect on what happened in my life. I can't run away from, from those demons. Right. And, and I think for some parents and some loved ones, they probably, for especially for their children, they got to have a real good look at what was going on with their children because they're now in the proximity to them 24-7 and you can't go nowhere else. And you got to know what little Jimmy 
can't do or wasn't doing in school. You got to really see when you were blaming the teacher for your child acting out. So now you're faced with the choice of, I need to get my baby some help. Whether it's educational or whether it's psychological help, I need to work on that. So it kind of put it in, like you're saying, it put it in their face. So they have to do something. Yes, ma'am. So what are you currently working on um, as you are, I would say, growing your empire? Because <laughs> I, I see you moving and shaking a lot. But, you know, um, I want you to tell everyone what you've been working on, like, um, especially to get this message out, to tell the story and to help others. What have you been doing? I am working. Well, I got a couple of things. I've been working on this documentary. It's called Consequence. And Consequence is going to look at child suicide. And it's going to look at it through the lens of children. And it's getting dark out here. I decided to sit outside. I'm sorry. Side note, because it's so beautiful. And I'll tell you about that, too. I'll tell you all about that. Um, <laughs> because, you know, we're going to look at it through the lens of adults who at one point considered suicide or even attempted suicide. But we're also going to look at it through the lens of the family members whose children were successful in committing suicide. We're going to look at it from the idea of politics, from school, social media. And we're going to have some real candid conversations and bring to the forefront the fact that this is something that we really, really need to focus on. It's something that we really need to get, get to the forefront and have real life conversations and save some children's lives because we're losing children. We're losing them, not just yeah, in the United States, are. but we're losing them globally. Like how in the world are we allowing our kids to allowing ourselves, our kids, internet bullying where how how do we allow that to take control of our children and i can i need to put this light on because you're gonna lose no huh? problem <laughs> you know i'm Let gonna lose you, you too what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna listen i'm gonna pick my my ipad up and i'm gonna walk with it because i'm gonna you know we're talking about listen. this whole tree thing and the see oh yeah and listen my my quote i have a quote that says a tree should be judged by the fruit it bears and not by the soil in mm. which it was planted and yes. i was not play- i i ended up a lot of what i've gone through people always assume that it's me and it's the, you know they they blame it on you know where she come from but yep. what i produce is in direct conflict of where i come from and you know yes. that daughter of mine that I had at barely 12 years old, she decided that her parents were old. So I'm going to move. She decided that her parents were old and she wanted to take care of her parents her, uh, and my husband and I. And she bought 18 acres of land. Mm. It has two houses on it. And she moved her parents mm. out here into this oasis. So that's why I wanted to be outside. But Wonderful. I'm going to show you. It, and it's, it's, you know, the thing is that God works in crazy ways. He really does. Yes, he does. I'm sorry. I'm standing up. And oh, I'm in your way. You're fine. Okay. Listen. For all of the craziness that I have gone through in my life, this is how God takes what was meant for evil and was meant for bad and turns it completely around. And I think that what people don't understand is that there is life after. You're going to go through a whole lot of crap. You're going to go through, you're going to go through all kinds of disappointments and you're going to go through, you're going to see evil because evil does exist. But let me tell you, when God decides that he's going to change your life and he's going to change the way you live and take all of that ugliness and turn it into something beautiful, then he moves you to a place of tranquility. 
Oh, and he oh. moves you to a place where you can say, thank you. You know, if I had to not go through all of the things that I went through in life in order to, and not have my daughter, I would go through it again because I cannot imagine a life without her in my life. Yes. And she has been a blessing to me. She has been a blessing to her father and to her siblings. And I am now moving to a place of tranquility. And I got dear girl. Ooh. <laughs> Listen, so this is what this is what I want the the viewers and listeners to think about. So imagine that you are entering a store. And imagine that that store, when you walk in, that to your left, you see a shelf, some shelves. And on, the, on, that, on those shelves, you see flowers. And the flowers come in, oh my gosh, the most amazing colors and the different species of flowers. Flowers that you love, flowers you would put on your table, flowers you would love to have someone purchase for you. Whatever your favorite flowers are, think about that. I want you to walk over there in your mind and pick those flowers up, your favorite, and smell them. And I want you to imagine the scent. I want you to imagine that uh, where you would place these flowers in your home. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to set that flower down, and I want you to look over to your right. And to your right, you see a fruit stand. And oh my gosh, the scents that are coming from these fruit. And I want you to see a peach, a beautiful ripe peach. And I want you to pick that peach up. I want you to feel it. I want you to smell it. And I want you to take a big bite out of it. And then I want you to imagine the juices flowing from that peach and, and the flesh bursting in your mouth and all the juices running down your arms and how delicious it is. It is sensational. Put that peach back. Now I want you to take a couple of steps back away from this table so you can see both of the tables at the same time. And I want you to look beneath those tables and I want you to see that there are a couple of sacks. There's a sack on, under each table and there's some writing on the sacks. And if you look closer, in black, there's the sacks are white. The writing is in black. And the writing on the sacks spell out the word manure. And I want you to understand that many of us got to go through a whole lot of crap. Some of us go through thicker layers of manure. Some of us go through th thinner layers. But guess what? We go through it in order to come out on the other side and be what people decided was beautiful, was delicious, was desirable, what was good in God's sight, what's good in man's sight. Those are the things that we have to go through. So don't decide that, oh, man, this is never going to happen. I'm going through all of these things and it's so traumatic. And why is it always me? You're going to come out on the other side. You just probably have to go through more crap than the next person. But when you come out, when you come out, you will be incredible. You will be stronger for it. You will be absolutely amazing. And you're going to remember me telling you this. And, and that's what I think that people need to understand. My crap is not going to be the same as yours. But you're going to come out on the other side. But you just can't give up. Don't give up. I wanted to. I promise I wanted to give up. I wanted to not be here. But I'm here. I'm standing. I'm impacting lives. I'm doing what I asked God to allow me to do. And that is to heal people from afar. So hopefully some of the things that I've shared with you will help you when it comes to deciding how you want to live your life and if you want to give up. Please don't. Please don't. Juanita's here. I'm here. And there's so many other incredible people in the world that are here to tell you that you're not alone. You're not the only one. You're not the person that's at fault. Because, again, I, I grazed over a lot of story 
in order to get the points to you. But there's a lot that I know that many of you have gone through that whew, the world may never know that you've gone through it, but you've come out on the other side and you're still here. You might be beat down. You might have some bruises and cuts all over you, but you're still here. And that counts for something. That counts for something. There's a reason that you're here. You just got to go through all of that ugliness and decide and discover what your purpose in life is. And once you discover it, then you need to walk boldly in that purpose. And don't allow other people to put their shame on your shoulder. And don't allow other people to make you think that you are responsible for anything that you've gone through. You are not at fault. It is whoever your abuser is, it's their fault. And it is whoever the people that were complicit in it, it is their fault, not yours. Ever is it yours. Because remember, there was a time when I was telling this man, well, you know, if you let us go outside and play, or so-and-so doesn't get a whipping, I'll play tickle with you. Does that make it my fault? I used to think so. I, I did. I used to think so, like... Well, I mean, you didn't do any better. You did offer it up to him sometimes. Yeah, I did. As a kid, trying to either get myself out of trouble or get my siblings out of trouble or even something as minor as going outside to play. But that doesn't make it my fault. And it took me decades to understand that. And I want you to understand that as well. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for saying that. Um, I'm glad you said that because, you know, I was going to ask you about that because we do blame ourselves. We thought if we were better, if we did this or, you know, um, maybe we, we messed up in some way and stuff like that. So thank you for pouring in to the listeners because they need to know it's not their fault. Yes, it is not. It isn't. And we don't want you to beat yourself up about them. So how can people connect with you? How can they find you? How can they, you know, work with you? Um, let us know. Uh, they can reach they can reach my website, clarissabags.com. I also just published a book. It is entitled, But First, Forgive okay. Yourself. And it is available in paperback on Amazon. So okay. go out there, check it out, But First, forgive yourself because you got to do that because again felt guilty but I had to forgive myself for laying that guilt at my own feet when I didn't deserve it okay you can look for me on Facebook I am on Instagram you can send me an email at info at clarissabags.com and I am willing to speak to anybody Send me a message. I promise I will message you back. I won't leave you hanging. But contact me. I'm here for you. Awesome. And I'll definitely make sure that they have that link to the book definitely in the show notes and on the website so that they can um, get a copy of that book as well. Um, Clarissa, thank you so much. So, so well, thank much you. Thank you for, for having me being here, because, again, we have to get this out. We have to be transparent in our stories and sharing them so that these children and even and I'll put it this way. And when I say children, I mean the ones that are in their 20s and their 30s and their 40s. They are still little children that have to be healed because they're going to be responsible for running this world. They're going to yes. be responsible. And so we we need whole and healthy individuals. And so it is our job to share our stories and be transparent. And I am grateful that she and, and also you know what? answered that call. One more thing I want to say. Sure. You, know, you see people that are sharing their stories decades later. Yes. And people on social media, these, these keyboard bullies, are the first ones to say, you're 60 years old. You wait till you're 60 years old to tell you this story? Why didn't you tell it earlier? Sweethearts, do not let that phase you. That's ignorance of yeah. what you've really gone through. These people have no clue. Yeah. Whenever you feel that you are safe enough to tell your story without any fear or repercussions, tell it. 
when you get to that place, it's only your time. Nobody else's time. Don't Absolutely. ever let anybody make you feel bad because you waited till you 80 years old to talk about something that happened when you were a kid. That's still a trauma. That's still something that has a hold on you, apparently, that you feel mm -hmm. like you need to talk about it. Talk mm -hmm. about it. Tell them what need to mm -hmm. tell them. Talk about it. Look, I will be 49 years old in December, and I didn't first begin to, I didn't begin to have a conversation or tell someone about my trauma without having a complete breakdown. I was almost 40 years old. Mm. Yes, ma'am. You know, so it takes, you know, I would rather you be 60, 70, 80, 90. I would rather you be that and have gone through the work and done the work so that your children, grandchildren and great grandchildren can now experience a whole and healed you. than yes. to keep it bottled up. And For tell some your people, own story. Yes. Because people go, let me tell you something. People made assumptions about me. They made very yeah. bad assumptions. And people would talk and they would say things that they thought they knew. So people yeah. are going to tell your story and they're going to tell it wrong. Tell your own yeah. story. Tell your story. And yeah. if you need help telling it or transitioning to therapy, we, reach out to one of us. Reach out. We are yes. here to help you through that process because we know what it like. We We know what it can feel like. But it's a part of the growing process. It's a part of the healing process. And we want you to grow and heal and walk and live in your purpose. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Clarissa, thank you. We, oh, we, I'm gonna have to have her back because there's a whole nother topic. I want to, we got <laughs> We got to talk about. Yes. You know, the good old, the look, I call it the good old grimy church conversation. And you know yeah. oh, what I'm yeah. talking about. Lord have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> but that is going to be for another time. That is going to be a twenty. That's a 2024 conversation. I promise Ooh. you guys that is coming yes. in 2024. But Clarissa, thank you for joining us on this evening. Oh my gosh. Um, much love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very, and very much welcome. Success. I appreciate you. And, and guys, you know, when you connect with her, get on the website, get on her mailing list. Connect so you can keep yes, going. Please. What's going on? You know, connect with me if you can't find. Connect with me because she has a documentary that's coming out that we have to support. Yes, and we have to share because again, it is about bringing light so that we can all be whole and healthy and heal. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. So, wasn't that wonderful, guys? Wasn't that wonderful? I, I told you when God gave me this director for season four, um, was I a little apprehensive at first? Absolutely. You know, it was shifting. It was changing the dynamic. But so many people need to hear more than just my story. They need to hear more than just my journey. And God has, del has delivered every time. Every person that he has given me, every person you have heard thus far, is God delivering and bringing that person forth. It has nothing of my own being. I just like to say that I am the vessel to make sure that you are able to heal properly. But come back on next Friday. Again, this is a every Friday thing. We're going to be back here next Friday, same time, same location. Be blessed. We love you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Thanks for joining us this week on the Moving Past You radio show. Make sure to visit our website at www.movingpastyou.com where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes. If you found value in the show, rate us on iTunes or simply tell a friend about the show. And be sure to tune in next Friday for our next episode. And remember to always be kind in your word, your thought, and in your deed. Be blessed.